Well, hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Neil Seidman. I'm co-chair of the Public Education Committee for ADAA. That's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And welcome to our webinar, uh, which is entitled Pedophiles, Rapists, and Murderers, Oh My, How to Disengage from Harm OCD and Reengage in Your Life. And our presenters are Dr. Deborah Kisson and Dr. Ashley Kendall. Before we start, I'd like to say just a little bit about ADAA, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. So ADAA is the leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety and depression. And our mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education, like this webinar, practice, and research. And we work to end the stigma and get the word out. These conditions are real, they're serious, and they're treatable. So I want to invite everybody to visit the ADA website, adaa.org. It's really a wonderful resource. There's a great list of treatment providers. Uh, and there's also a free peer-to-peer online support group that you can find right on the home page. Okay, so let's get started. I'm really happy to introduce our presenters. Deborah Kisson, PhD, is the clinical director of the Light on Anxiety Treatment Center of Chicago. She's a clinical fellow at ADAA. And she's also co-chair of ADAA's Public Education Committee. Dr. Kisson specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy, that's CBT for short, for anxiety and stress-related disorders, including OCD, and also PTSD, panic disorder, agoraphobia, social anxiety disorder, and other anxiety disorders. Dr. Kisson uses the principles of evidence-based treatments while at the same time treating the whole person with deep respect for the human spirit and the challenges that we all face on our journey through life. Okay. Ashley Kendall, PhD, is a clinical psychologist at the Light on Anxiety Treatment Center in Chicago. Dr. Kendall is actively engaged in both scientific research and clinical practice. And her work has been published in top medical and psychological journals, including the Journal of Abnormal Psychology and the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. In her clinical practice, Dr. Kendall specializes in combining CBT with mindfulness-based techniques to help patients navigate life transitions and overcome anxiety, stress, and depression. So let me turn it over now to Dr. Kisson and Dr. Kendall. Okay, thank you, Neil. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, coming through great. Wonderful. So I'm sitting here with Dr. Kendall in sunny, kind of sunny Chicago, and we are super excited to be presenting this material on harm OCD. And we work together on OCD cases and on harm OCD cases, and not to discount any of the wonderful, wonderful clients that we work with, but it, it really is very satisfying and, and fun, dare I say fun, to work on harm OCD cases because to see clients get such rapid relief is really rewarding and, and they deserve it. Of course, all everyone does deserve less suffering, but th this kind of OCD has a way of really bringing you down and so that the more that we can do to help uplift people where they belong is it's really our honor. So 
Uh, and as we move through this presentation, Neil has a couple of questions that healthcare consumers have have asked us ahead of time that he's going to inject throughout the presentation, but also for all of our wonderful attendees that are here joining us, you don't have to wait till the end. Feel free to type a question and Neil will keep track of them and then find different ways to pose these questions. So feel free to ask, ask away as we go through the material. So thank you for joining us. And let's see. All right, so we will be just kind of quickly moving through the outline, talking a little bit about what is OCD, and then in contrast to what's harm OCD, why does harm OCD grab upon such painful content? Uh, how, how does one know for sure that they definitely, most certainly, without a doubt, have harm OCD? So we'll kind of talk about that a little bit, talk about some case studies, what treatment can look like, when is it time to get help and tips for getting help? And we're hoping this is just the start of presentations on this topic. So if there's anything we don't get to today, we are hoping to put something together again sometime sooner rather than later. So this is just the start of the fun. Okay, so what is OCD? The American Psychiatric Association, let's see if that, okay, sorry, um, defines OCD as the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. So the obsession, the O of OCD, entails some kind of intrusive, bothersome, persistent thought. And then the compulsion is simply an act behavior that one engages in to decrease the distress associated with the thought. So the obsession causes the distress, the compulsion is engaged in to try to decrease or minimize the distress or potential for harm that's associated with the obsession. Although what, what, what actually happens is it's really the compulsions that ends up causing the truest harm for an individual's life. So having a scary thought, oh no, what if I lose control and run around naked and start screaming that it's not that thought that is going to negatively impact my life. But if I then don't go to meetings, if I then don't leave the house, if I then am constantly checking to make sure I still have clothing on, it's really the compulsions that end up decreasing functioning and impairing life. And so it's a, that's the tricky one that is going to take some time to work through because the obsession feels as a, it's so painful. Like but, if I want to make, if I'm having a scary thought that I might hurt somebody, right? And then I spend hours during my day checking to make sure that I don't know all the knives are put away or something like that, whatever my compulsion is, then that's really interfering with my life. All right. that time it's and not, effort and energy. Right. So all that time spent checking knives and counting knives and avoiding avoiding knives. All the time spent avoiding people. So we'll, we'll get to how it can, different ways it shows up. But the interesting, one of the many interesting parts of OCD and harm OCD is it's really those compulsions that impair functioning. So we'll, we'll get into that. And can so I interrupt like, with a great question, even though it's a little uh, bit of getting a little bit ahead? Definitely. Uh, that it, this is from a therapist. She's talking about a client who says that even if she has a thought that she could harm somebody, that that's just unforgivable, and she just needs to, you know, feel bad and punish herself for having this terrible, terrible thought. Right. And what we'll what we'll get at, and what really it takes some playing around with to understand, is that we could have an awful thought. So right now, I could have the thought. I'm going to stab my child. I'm going to stab my child. I'm going to stab my child. That's a thought. That's some neurons flickering in my head. Do I deserve to be punished for that? No. If I harm my child, do I deserve to be punished? We could get into details what that means. Yes. So there's a big difference between thoughts and behavior. So we try to really help people break apart what thought action fusion. So having a thought is equivalent to having doing a behavior. I could think about, I'm gonna make the world a better place and do so much community service, 
I'm going to do all these wonderful things, but that's not equivalent to the action. I have done nothing to make the world a better place. And it's no different with having a bad thought. So we'll, um, and, and the more you practice that, that's when you really kind of get it. It's one thing hearing that conceptually, but really practicing having a scary thought and realizing that's not the same thing as a scary behavior. So, so having a thought is not the same thing as an action. No, for better, for worse. We could think how much we're going to, I was thinking I was going to get this presentation prepared. I was thinking I was going to get this presentation prepared. It wasn't until I did the behavior of preparing this presentation that it became, that it came into being. So I could have thought morning, noon, and night, but that wasn't going to make it happen. So, and just kind of the common media representation that we see of OCD is kind of that contamination OCD. So I, a quick image here of as good as it gets. So somebody washing their hands, avoiding germs. And then I think more and more, we're seeing more media representations of other kinds of OCD. So that's good. We want as much public education as possible. I think harm OCD is really, uh, there's less understanding of it, which all the more makes it terrifying for somebody who's experiencing it. So- Am I the only one? I am going the wrong way. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so harm OCD, um, I have here, same old OCD, so new content. So maybe old OCD, or what we imagine, like, oh, everything needs to be clean, I can't be germy, I'm going to get sick, maybe I'll get someone else sick. Maybe harm OCD is I'm going to lose control and saw apart my children. So it might be a little bit more gasp-worthy for the uninformed when you're first having that thought, but it really has the same function for the brain of, oh no, oh no, what if I'm germy? Oh no, what if I lose control and stab the people I love the most? I am keep going the wrong, oh no, what if I go the wrong way in my presentation? So common harm OCD themes that we see the most, and, and OCD is so clever, so that there's always, if we don't get to a theme, it doesn't mean it's not part of harm OCD. It has lots of creative ways of saying like, what would be the worst thing that could possibly happen? And we have some time limitations in listing the, the creative ways that the mind might come up with themes. But what we often see, what if I lose control and say something completely racially inappropriate, especially in places that it would be the most racially inappropriate. So I had a client who was an English, um, uh, uh, English as a second language teacher. And so she, her, what if I lose control and say something racially inappropriate? It, it normally is targeted to the very audience that you most want to help or that would it would be the most inappropriate to say something in front of. Uh, also thoughts or images of harming loved ones, uh, normally those that you are closest to. So, and, and it's normally a very rapid motion, like stabbing or pushing or shoving down the steps, shoving in the fire, uh, the building fire garbage chute versus like slowly punching a hundred times over an hour. It has this sort of rapid impulsive motion to it. Like it just happens. So it's cause it's that feeling. What if it just, you just lose control and do something. Uh, another common category thoughts or images of engaging in sexually inappropriate acts. And that would be uh, that could be, uh, what if I'm a pedophile? What if I am attracted to my dog? What if, I, um, uh, what if I'm attracted to my dad? What if, what are, I have Dr. Kendall here with me. What are other, what if? My child, um, child, my niece. Uh, so whoever you, you hold your relationship most close to and would want to protect and not in any way harm that relationship is normally what it would go for. And, and Dr. Kendall is going to go through some case studies to get into more detail about this, but just wanted to sprinkle some some topics. That, it sounds that, like it's a very tricky thing that it's it's going for the things that I care the most about. Oh, that. Ah, ah, sorry. Um, yes, you are one. You are one slide ahead of us, which is good. <laughs> that means that we're that means we're on the right track in this conversation. So, before we say how and the kind of themes it does come up for, but yes, you got it. The things that you hold the most dear in your life, 90% of the cl non-clinical population would report having the same out of control. What if I just screamed something inappropriate? What if I was driving and I hit the gas and not the brakes? What if I just had, wanted to have sex with 
this person that would be completely inappropriate for me to be attracted to. So having strange thoughts is called having a human monkey mind. And our mind is always moving about going through different content that it thinks is interesting or scary or novel. Do Dr. Kendall, are, I'm sorry, Dr. Kissner, are you saying that these kinds of thoughts are normal? Yeah, the thoughts are not abnormal. What is abnormal is actually the reaction to the thought, the reaction of, I can't have this thought. Oh no, did I have this thought? I need to always look out for having this thought. I need to spend all day thinking about other things to make sure I don't have that thought. Because the very act of trying to not have a thought, the only way you're knowing that you're not thinking about killing your child is thinking, oh no, am I killing my child? Am I going to have that thought? So by the very act of trying to not have the thought, by definition, you have to have the thought in order to make sure you don't have it. So unfortunately, the, the less tolerant one is of these thoughts, the more they increase their frequency. And do having these thoughts, so here's the, one of the questions that came in ahead of time. <clears throat> Does having these kinds of thoughts mean that this is what I truly desire to do? Hmm. Um, and the only reason I'm pausing right now, if this was in, in session, we're really, really, really careful with reassurance, which I'll talk about is one of the many main compulsions that one engages in with harm OCD. So to guarantee that it is in fact not something that one wants to do is actually an impossible task. Like for me to guarantee you right now, I don't want to eat ch chocolate ice cream. I can't guarantee that to myself. What I could tell you is I do not really like chocolate ice cream. I really only like vanilla ice cream. I mean, there was the occasion where I've liked chocolate, but I really don't like it. Right now, I'm actually in the mood for something more salty. I could pretty much sort of tell, I, I pretty much know I do not want chocolate ice cream right now, but to guarantee that is just a can of worms. And so we'll, we're gonna get into this, but the very act of trying to prove that in fact, this is definitely not what I want is a formula for more harm OCD. So kind of a little bit about what you said before about why such painful themes. So the function of the OCD network of the brain is to say, oh no, is there anything bad happening? Oh no, is there anything I need to look out for? Oh no, did I leave the pot boiling over? Oh no, did I leave the door unlocked? Oh no, can my child walk into the street and get hit by a car? It's good to have like the oh no network of the brain. And then it's linked to the, oh, I gotta do something right now to fix it. So it's the area of the brain saying, oh no, is something wrong and I better do something right now to fix it. We all, ha we need it for survival. That's good and fine. But for OCD, it's really an area that gets super overcharged, kind of a tool in the toolbox that gets overused. So it's always on high alert with lots of false alarms of, oh no, did I leave the iron in? Oh no, did I not lock the door? Oh no, do I wanna stab my child? Um, and so these false alarms can be very uncomfortable when the brain is always giving the signal like, oh no, something's wrong and you need to do something to fix it. And so that's OCD in general. When it comes to harm OCD, it's kind of it, not only like, oh no, did I leave the iron on that could cause my house to burn down, which by the way, that would be my fault. And then the people I care most about could die. So it, they start overlapping, but with harm OCD in particular, like, oh no, what if I were the cause of harm to the people I care most about. So this was, this is an OCD monster that I created. It, it really, it's, sometimes I tell clients, it's like a well-intended but super unhelpful friend. Like it's not trying to be awful, it's just trying to help. It just is not that helpful at being helpful when it's on overdrive. So the OCD monster might say like, oh no, what would be the worst thing that could possibly happen to those that I care the most about? What if I were the one to cause harm to those that I cared most about. That would be absolutely awful. So kind of what the things that cause me the most joy in my life and make life worth living for me, what if I, nice, huh? I'm, I'm showing Dr. Kendall my fancy <laughs> animation. So what if I were, to call, I were to be the one to cause harm, to puncture the very aspects of my life that create joy and satisfaction? And that's kind of the area that harm OCD goes for. Neil, you still there? Yeah, so kind of like a false alarm. Yep, a false alarm, uh, which could just be false alarm 
the building's on fire. Oh, it's not really on fire. Oh, false alarm. Were you just looking at your child in a way that you're sexually attracted to them? False alarm. Yeah. You're not. That so so like, that's a good analogy. So like if, if the false alarm was the building is on fire, that's, that's one of the worst things that could happen to a building would be to burn down. Mm -hmm. And so the false alarm with harm OCD is what if I hurt the people I care the most about? Right. Look, look right. out. Look out. You're going to hurt them. Look out. Right. And not only what if they were to get hurt, my kids, my loved ones, but what if I am the one to actually hurt those I love the most about? How would I ever live with myself after that? Like life would have to be over. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So OCD watches over that, which is most important in your life. So for clients, sometimes they say, if you really, if you want to figure out what you value the most, just flip OCD upside down. So if your harm OCD is harming your children, then I would make a pretty good bet that your children are extremely important in your life. Or um, you could, I mean, I, I invite the individuals that are on this webinar right now, take a moment and think about a recent harm obsession that you have, or if you have a loved one that is experiencing it, and then try to think what, how does that relate to a core value that makes your life worth living or uh, your loved one. And so harm OCD is never, it's kind of being silly here, but it would never say, oh no, what if I lose control and spill some milk? Like that would be <laughs> super not interesting. Like, okay, you'd be down some milk, which is an ideal, but that's not a target that harm OCD, I mean, I guess unless someone's core value is preserving every ounce of milk, but that's, I've yet to find that many people that have that as a core value. So. Any questions? So the, I know so the content of the of the harm OCD is actually revealing our most dear values. Mm-hmm. So and I hope the next slide is what I'm hoping, but it's not. But yeah, what were you gonna say? Uh, it's a question that came in uh, acknowledging and understanding these thoughts, but how do I how do I keep from getting really discouraged and depressed about these thoughts keep popping up, keep coming in? Yeah, and, and we are going to get to this, but what I would say is is really helpful to have some support to move through the treatment, to learn how to take the wind out of the sails of these thoughts. Because on, on your own, they might just keep grabbing upon you and feeling so critical. And, and the treatment protocol is exposure and habituation and learning to take kind of the oomph factor out of the thoughts. And, but it's similar to say going to the gym and if you have a really big weight loss goal, how do you, and it takes a while to lose that weight. How do you not get discouraged and keep going every week and keep sticking to the, the wellness goals that you created for yourself? Even though it's hard work, it's still important to you. So it's no different than anything else or getting a degree that's gonna take you a lot of years. How do you stick with it and not get so discouraged. Anything that's really hard, it's it's kind of the same muscle you have to work. Mm -hmm. uh, Here's a really great question. Uh, so you the slide, a couple slides before you said, hey, ninety percent of the population has thoughts like just like this. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what's a good way to describe what non-OCD people do when they have these kinds of thoughts? Do they say just kind of like, oh, that was a weird thought, whatever, and move on? Exactly. That's exactly okay. it. Oh, okay, weird brain. Anyway, next. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, don't, they don't get stuck with them. They right. don't try to get rid of them. Right, exactly. Mm, okay, so. Okay, here's a similar question. Do you uh, believe that people with harm OCD have a faulty system where they get this rush of anxiety when these thoughts come in that other people don't have? Mm. I'm always very delicate with words like faulty system, but I would say I like the equivalent of maybe um, your email, the spam drive is not capturing all of the spam mail as effectively, so it's going into the standard mail or even prior priority mail. So. The ability to sort out, yes, this is truly danger and a true message, a critical message versus more spam mail is 
underperforming. Okay. Okay, so common compulsion. Sometimes clients come to us and, and say, well, I, I have pure O. Oh, I have these really, really scary thoughts and they're awful, uh, but I, I'm not doing any compulsions. And often what they mean by that is they're not doing any obvious external compulsions that they are realizing, such as knocking or counting or checking the door or washing. But there's always something in place that one is attempting to do to manage the distress of the thought. So that might be mentally reviewing a situation like, did I touch that child? I leaned in that direction, but was that me just leaning to hand them a paper? Or was I really leaning to touch the child? Or maybe asking for reassurance from a friend or loved one, like, I did this, is that bad? Or trying to think good thoughts to counterbalance the bad thoughts, avoidance, so I have here some pictures of maybe like locking the knives, hiding the knives, um, or um, avoiding, so I have a person covering their eyes, like avoiding being anywhere near kids for fear that they're gonna have bad thoughts or sexually inappropriate thoughts. So there's, there's it might take a little bit more work to figure out what the compulsions are, but if there were no compulsions, then it wouldn't be, OCD because somebody wouldn't be trying to avoid those thoughts. So the main differentiator of differentiator of harm OCD and more standard OCD, we use the term egocentric. So egocentric it's in, in line with one's values. So maybe somebody who has just right OCD and, and or symmetry OCD and needs everything lined up on their desk perfectly, their pens perfectly lined up and their paper perfectly lined up. They would say it's in line with their values. Like, yes, it's very good to be organized and I strive to be organized. Eventually it might come down to like, wow, I'm spending 10 hours a day getting organized and one hour a day actually getting my work done and I'm gonna get fired and my life is not functioning. I'm not living the way I wanna live. This is no longer working. But the actual goal of lining up items might be originally in line with one's value versus ego dystonic is, is it's at odds and competing with one's values. So I value being a really a, a good teacher and kind to my students and protecting them from all harm. And so having thoughts of sexually molesting your students, the reaction to the thoughts would be like, why the blank, blank, blank? Mm -hmm. Am I having these thoughts? What's wrong with me? So it's ego dystonic at odds with one's value. Okay, and I think after this it's gonna be Ashley, but um, so one word of, advice well i guess we have lots of words of advice but another big compulsion that we see a lot on the checking front is checking to see for sure if one is really experiencing harm ocd and it's not really that they are a pedophile or a psychopath or deranged or all of those things so ocd is known in some circles as the doubting disease ocd wants to know with 100 percent certainty that the door is locked and that the hands are germ-free and all of these good things and that one will not create harm to those that they love love the most so it doesn't want to know yeah it's really unlikely it wants to know with 100 percent certainty that one will not hurt their loved ones and the thing is that no one can guarantee that i can't guarantee that i'm not going to lose control dr kendall can't neil can't nobody i could say so far i do not believe i have but if i thought too long about it minds have a way of twisting around even prior experience like well was that me losing control so it gets tricky to prove to yourself that in fact it's not something that you want and um the, by definition any future behavior is going to be uncertain nobody can guarantee what they will or will not do in the future so a common um we can we watch for check so a common uh, compulsion that we see is uh, in our clients individuals might google um Pet, like checklists of like, am I a pedophile versus harm OCD? Or uh, what are the main signs of being a psychopath? And, and trying to prove to themselves that they don't fit those criteria. But the bottom line is, it's really impossible to, I, I just Googled a random pedophile checklist, but pedophiles commonly experience their sexual urges as egocentric to justify their behavior. They frequently rationalize, minimize, and normalize their interactions. If you think about this long and hard enough, anyone can twist their own behaviors and prior behaviors into anything. And so step one of, um, we, we call this psychoeducation, where we do start treatment with here, here are the main differentiators and here is information on harm OCD. But really after the first few sessions, 
anytime someone is trying to know for sure that it's harm OCD and not their feared state, they're really, as we put it, feeding the beast because they're just gonna deepen the neural network of the harm OCD. Because really, none of these things can be proven with certainty for any of us. And, and if I'm uh, devoted to a project of proving to myself 100% that my obsession isn't true, like that I'm not a pedophile, right? Uh, that I might spend, you know, every moment of every day for years, and I still can't prove it. No, no, it cannot be proven that one. And is that not. and that act of of trying to prove it is isn't that a compulsion? That oh, like that's, a, you know, that's a humongo compulsion. And in those hours, it's really depressing because you're missing out on valued living. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy to do that. And then there's that's a lot less energy to things that really matter to would, would that Would that qualify as a compulsion if I'm oh. spending lots of hours trying to reassure myself and trying Absolutely. to research something? Is that Re a compulsion? Reassurance, mental reviewing is probably the top compulsion when it comes okay. to uh, harm OCD. So we okay. had a really good question that yeah, came yeah. in yeah. that said, how do I figure out what my compulsions are? And so what I'm hearing is, well, look at some of the things that you might be spending your time on to try to reassure yourself or to try to prove to yourself that that uh, harm thought is untrue. Well, the quickest way to figure out if something is a compulsion versus sort of just a standard behavior, like washing hands, after going to the bathroom, reasonable, good, has helped to avoid many diseases over time. But if it becomes excessive in terms of how much you're engaging in it, if you can't hold off, if you need to wash your hands a second you get out of the bathroom versus maybe waiting a minute and standing in the bathroom, it's that urgency of I must do it now or else I will feel awful. So you know you're in compulsion territory when there's a behavior, like unless oh, my pants are on fire. I must find a bucket and pour water on my pants. That's not a compulsion because I feel a very strong urge to get the fire off my pants. But if you feel like your pants are on fire and that badly do you need to do a behavior, but yet your pants aren't on fire, you're probably in somewhere near a compulsion. Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> Great, so here we got Dr. Kendall. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in now with some case studies. And these are all, we've removed the key identifying information, but these are all based on patients who we actually treated here at Light on Anxiety for harm OCD. And we really just wanted to give you a flavor for these types of people, including because as Dr. Kissin said, these really are some of the most wonderful people and some of our very favorite patients. So um, first off, we had Stephanie, who was in her early 30s. She was a second grade math and science teacher, and she volunteered in her free time with the Big Sisters, Big Brothers program here in Chicago, so very devoted to sort of positive youth development. And then we had Greg, who I think sold computer software, and above all, he was really this devoted husband and father, so so much of his treatment focused on how can he be the best possible partner, how can he help his kids, we had Lucas, who is an attorney, I think in his 40s. He provided legal services to low-income communities here on Chicago's South Side. So for example, working, helping people get um, access to healthcare, access to um, housing. And then finally, Chloe, who was a very skilled physician here. She was a practicing radiologist who supervised medical students, as well as actually a professor of radiology at one of the prominent medical schools. So really a leader in her field and someone who people very much relied on in stressful situations, both clinically and um, in the research settings. And she was doing this really cutting edge work and sort of at the forefront of those projects. I'm just gonna quickly inject, and not only are the names changed, but also all other identifying information. So yes. these are sort of estimates of the kind of amazing people, but in terms of the organizations that they worked at, the kind of the exact details, they are also edited too. So yes. for anyone listening, this flavor. is sort of, yeah, the flavor of the people, that, the wonderful people we see. Yes, and now a flavor of some of the common kinds of um, obsessions that we see. And I'm just going to read through these. Some of these we've already hit on. I'm going to stab my wife and children. I'm a pedophile. How can I be sure I've never had sex with a child? 
I'm going to accidentally say the N-word the next time that I talk with an African-American colleague, and I'm going to go crazy on my next flight, and they'll actually have to ground the airplane to calm me down. And uh, you might have seen this coming based on what we've told you already, but here we have matched each of the patients with sort of the predominant obsession that they were struggling with. And I should say that there's a huge amount of overlap. So often, if you're struggling with one of those areas, you're going to see other, um, others come up as well. But it was Stephanie, our math and science teacher, who was so concerned with what if I'm a pedophile? And in particular, how can I, never, how can I be sure that I've never done anything wrong? So she would you know, scour her email, her inbox, to look through and look for any evidence that something might have gone wrong. Um, she avoided certain parts of the school so that she wouldn't be alone with a child in a way that she worried it might set her up to act on some sort of forbidden impulse. And then Greg, our very devoted family man, was the one who was so concerned about, I'm going to you know, hurt my family. And these were concerns that first came out for him actually um, on his honeymoon. And that was when he first started to have these thoughts, what if I stab my wife? And it was, of course, highly distressing to him because he loved her very much. He didn't understand where they were coming from. And when he shared them with his wife, they were understandably really scary to her. And I don't think that she felt um, physically in harm's way, but she felt like, you know, was this some sort of repressed urge? Did he actually want to hurt her in some way? Was he angry at her? So it was this really confusing kind of painful situation for them without this understanding of what was going on. So sorry to interrupt just for a moment, but these two examples again show how the harm OCD uh, goes for uh, the area which is our most dear value in life. Exactly. That's exactly right. And why we tried to sort of pull these out. So yeah, thank you for highlighting that. Um, so yeah, continuing exactly along those lines, uh, Lucas, the attorney who was working with these low-income communities in Chicago's South Side, so often communities of color, was the one who was worried about saying something that was, um, you know, some sort of racial slur uh, in front of these groups. And then finally, Chloe, you know, our esteemed physician who was so competent, who really took care of others, was the one who worried about, you know, suddenly going crazy, losing her mind on an airplane and, you know, literally taking everyone down with her. Um, so as Neil just pointed out, a couple of the takeaways here are first that people who struggle with harm OCD, it is going after their values. So I always say, you know, I've worked with a couple of kids who become so concerned that they're going to murder their own dog. And that's just not going to work. It's not going to stick if you get a kid who doesn't care tremendously about animals and about their dog in particular. Um, in that same way, part of the reason I think people don't you know, react to these thoughts so much, the non-clinical population, is that it might not go after things they value so much. They have a passing thought and they go, eh, whatever. Um, but if it's something you hold so dear, it's gonna stick in your head. And then the second point that I think this nicely illustrates is this key distinction that Dr. Kissin was making between thoughts and actions and who you are in this world. So here are these people who are so engaged, who are doing wonderful things in our world, and they feel like monsters because they're having all these thoughts, you know, just running through their minds. But when you look at their actual behaviors, they're doing this great work, and it is important to to really acknowledge that distinction. So I got here's a question that came in: Should I be able? Shouldn't I be able to control my thoughts? <laughs> if anyone could do that, I am super impressed, and I would love to meet them. I don't believe that there is anybody on our planet who's able to control their thoughts. Um, within Can I the, control my actions, though? We, yes. So um, one thing that we talk about is, you know, the thing that we have the most immediate sort of quote-unquote control over is, yeah, is our behaviors. And through that, we can sometimes impact our thoughts. But our thoughts, they just, they come up. Like Dr. Kissin said, we have these monkey minds. They bounce all over. And it's normal, you know, if I see someone dressed really provocatively, I'm likely to have, you know, thoughts that maybe I don't want to in the context, but that's a really natural response. And um, just the other day, I was at a really crowded intersection and I was right at the front of my car and I had the thought if I, you know, put my foot on the gas, I could plow through these people. Um, I don't know how I could ever not have that thought, but I can work on accepting it and working on my own reactions to the thoughts, which brings us nicely into our treatment slide here. Um, so the key point is that harm OCD is treatable. That doesn't mean that the thoughts go away entirely, because of course they, they haven't for any of us, um, but that does mean that we're able to experience much less distress. We understand why they're happening, 
And typically through that process, um, the thoughts do die down. You don't have as many of them. So a core component of treatment is something called exposure and response prevention, or ERP. And um, we'll go into this more in a moment, but just to give you sort of one concrete illustration, if you are a person who's really worried, for instance, about stabbing your wife, um, the exposure would be to expose yourself to the scary things. So maybe you actually hold a knife when you're in the kitchen with her. Hopefully, you're able to get to the point where you hold that knife over your wife. And the response So I'm kind of facing the fear in a way. Beautiful, yes, exactly. You are going towards the fear. And you're preventing your habitual response, which would probably be to avoid it. So if somehow you'd found yourself in a situation, you know, where you're in the kitchen with knives, you would get yourself out of that room because you don't want to be anywhere near that. You don't want to chance it. And what's happening from a learning perspective each time you do that is your anxiety is starting to go up, your threat system is saying there's something alarming going on here, and then it's only going down because you get away from this thing that you fear. And that's reinforcing this message that it's actually a bad thing when it isn't. So part of what we're sort of doing is we're rewiring the brain to learn that I can stay in this situation, I can hold this knife over my partner until my fear goes down, and then I start to see, okay, this was a false alarm. This isn't a real threat. So the exposure and response prevention is the core part of the treatment, and it's very different than what I've been doing if I have harm OCD. Exactly. Exactly. It's probably the opposite of what you've been doing up to this point. And the basic idea underlying it is that, believe it or not, your brain can get tired of absolutely anything with enough exposure. So for instance, if you see you know, a horror movie and the first time you see it, at uh, the moment of the big murder, it's really scary, you kind of look away, you didn't see it coming. Um, if you watch that movie again and again and again and you know exactly when the murderer is gonna jump out and you know what the music does and maybe you even learn some background information where the cameras were and what went into that fake blood, Try as you might, you're not going to find it scary. You're probably going to find it pretty boring. And that's exactly the premise behind the type of treatment that we're doing. And does that eventually lower my anxiety if, I, if I'm able to keep doing this exposure? Yes. And that's a great point, which is that we really want people to stay in these situations that feel scary until the anxiety starts to go down. Because people will sometimes come to us and they'll say, all right, well, I've, you know, I do go into the kitchen, I do get around knives, and yet this is still going on. And typically the problem in that situation is that they're kind of white knuckling through it. They're there, but they're terrified. And they're getting out of there, and that's when the anxiety goes down for them. That's not so good, because it's going to reinforce this idea inside of you that the only way to get relief is to get away from the scary thing. So like you said, we really want you in that scary situation until your anxiety goes down. Okay, now I have a question that came in and this sounds like someone who's been doing some of these exposures. Mm -hmm. You know, what the specifics are, of course, I don't know, but it sounds like this uh, individual has been doing some of these kinds of exposures. And the question is, how does he cope with uh, strong feelings not of anxiety, but also disgust and also sadness when he's doing these exposures? How does he cope with that? Yeah, that's a wonderful question and something that these patients absolutely struggle with, which is really understandable. Um, we'll hit on this more in a moment, but I think that this goes back to really not going at this treatment alone. Um, so having someone who understands what's going on, who's by your side, can be really critical. It's great if that's a therapist, but it doesn't have to be. So you can you know, bring a Harm OCD book to a friend of yours or to your partner and read it together, talk about it, and start to get some relief. Um, but it's almost impossible. It's like if you're in an echo chamber, just going through this by yourself to just muscle your way past some of these feelings of guilt. So having someone on board with you can be really powerful. This is Dr. Kisson. Just adding to that, so sometimes there's a risk in letting go of the guilt or the disgust. Oh, no. If, and, and as we see people getting better, there's also kind of a new anxiety that will often show up as you're doing exposures of, oh no, well now these thoughts aren't making me disgusted and anxious. What if that actually means that I really like these things or I want to do these things? And so to give up the disgust and let them just be brain noise, are you going to get to the brain? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, oh. Um, is it, it's a risk of letting, of not going down the rabbit hole with the reaction. 
of, oh no, what if that means it's true? Like, I don't know, maybe it does. And I'm choosing to right now have this moment with my child. So part of it is also being willing to give up really engaging in that disgust and guilt versus feeling like you need it or deserve it or there's some protective value in it. Mm -hmm. I'm nodding emphatically, although you yes. can't see me. Yes, so. she is. <laughs> Very much agreed. Um, here we'll move through this sort of quickly, but um, oftentimes as part of your treatment for harm OCD, you'll put together something called a fear hierarchy, whether you do this formally in therapy or more informally through a help with the workbook or something like that. Um, but here's an example of a hierarchy from uh, Greg, quote unquote, the patient who was concerned about stabbing his wife. So typically you, you rank these different fears. These are the things that would be hard for you to do. Anywhere from you know one or two out of say 10, the scale doesn't really matter. Um, and these are things that would be distressing, but not not absolutely terrible. You know, you could imagine doing it. For him, this was like being in the kitchen alone, holding a knife while his family's in other rooms, but not in the kitchen with him. Up through like a 10 out of 10 or nine out of 10. And for Greg, this was holding a knife over his wife in the kitchen. This was something that at the beginning of treatment felt insurmountable and terrifying. And so then, you're giving yourself some gradual steps to work through instead of having to do the whole thing all at once. Exactly. And you're giving yourself a roadmap. So you're starting to figure out, all right, what, what fears do I need to confront here? And you're welcome to hop in sort of at a higher end. Um, the risk there is always, you know, maybe if you don't have the support, there could be more burnout. But it's, you know, it won't, if you're able to succeed, that's great. Um, but typically we work through sort of roughly in the order of the hierarchy. I always say it's a living document. It changes as we go. Um, but so, you know, with this patient for one week, I had him work each day just on being in the kitchen, holding that knife, family not there, until his anxiety went down, until it just became commonplace for him. And then we worked in session. Um, he would describe to me in vivid detail, as much as he could muster, this image that would come into his mind of stabbing his wife. And what he found, and most people will, is that although these thoughts feel incredibly compelling and vivid, when you try and pause, when you try and really kind of pin it down, um, there's a lot of missing pieces. So I'd ask him, you know, what is she wearing? Or what are you wearing? Is it hard to stab her? Are you saying anything? Um, and a lot of it's kind of unknown because it's, again, it's like watching that horror film where you might cover your eyes and sort of it shoots in and you don't want to see it. So we're just, we're slowing down the process and saying, hey, not scared of you. Um, we actually were able to skip this next item and this happens a lot. You start to see like your gains in one area kind of trickle over. So after he did these first two things, being in the kitchen with his wife while he was holding a knife just in another part wasn't scary anymore, so we didn't have to formally assign that. Um, we then went through and had him say out loud in session many, many times, I want to stab my wife with a knife, I want to stab my wife with a knife, to the point of it getting totally boring for everyone. Um, and then ultimately got him to the point of holding the knife over his wife in the kitchen, and this was tremendously helpful to him. It's really what ultimately moved him through a lot of this. And just quickly, I will say that um, about two months later, he had sort of a little bit of a relapse. So he actually got a promotion at work. It was exciting, but more stress. And these thoughts about killing his wife started to come back. And that's really common. If there's stress even in an unrelated area of life, sometimes this is uh, sort of how your mind responds. And he was really sad. He felt like, oh my God, everything's undone. I'm back to square one. And he wasn't. So we were able to hop in right towards the top of the hierarchy. He moved past these fears again pretty quickly. Um, but that that's just totally normal. Progress isn't linear. It kind of goes so up a, and down. It's a process. Here's a good question that came in. For doing these kinds of exposures, uh, what is the typical length of time you recommend? 15 minutes, 30 minutes? And then do you also recommend short exposures throughout the day, such as bringing up a scary thought intentionally? It's kind of like any muscle where the more going to the gym twice a week is great. Going to the gym once a week is great too. But if you go to the gym every day, you're getting that more consistent practice. So we're doing exposures twice a day in short intervals can be very powerful. Sometimes we always have to say this about everything that it can become a compulsion almost to do exposures of I need to always do my compulsions and my exposures so so often to make sure I don't have any OCD. So I'd say having a little bit of a flexible approach. There's no perfect formula and we want to avoid the perfect and really go for good enough. And so I'd say trying to consistently, whether that's 15 minutes or 30 minutes, if you're doing it that much more than that, there 
a couple times a day, there might not be that much more time for the rest of life. So unless you're really in a intensive program where you're, it's such severe OCD, more than an hour a day just might, there just might not be that much more room for other aspects of life doing the exposures. But it also, it's gonna depend. So there's a correlation between the severity of OCD and how, how frequently it might make sense to practice ERP. Now here's a comment, I think this is from a therapist that just is making the point that a way of helping somebody get started could be actually doing something lower on the hierarchy uh, right with the therapist, like, I don't know, holding a butter knife or a plastic knife during the therapy session. Exactly. That's exactly right. Sometimes that can be saying something out loud in session. Sometimes that can be, um, yeah, holding a butter knife, anything like that is is right. And that can kind of help jumpstart that process. And it illustrates nicely, I think, how having someone around is helpful. None of this is rocket science, um, but it can be hard to face your biggest fears on your own. So it's really, it's useful to have that structure. Right. So, right. Um, Here's a certainly... comment from the same therapist says she keeps knives in her office. <laughs> Various yeah, sizes. Do. Great. Good job. Whoever is out there. Good job. <laughs> good job. Good job. Um, so some key points, some key takeaways, of course, um, there's more to all of this, and we'll show you some resources in a moment and perhaps get to go into it more with you in the future. But um, basically, go towards the thing that scares you. When in doubt, do the opposite of the compulsion. So if you are inclined to avoid a park with children because you're worried maybe you're a pedophile, um, walk by that park. If you're worried about being in the kitchen with knives around, go in the kitchen, hold that knife, hold it over your loved one. Um, do the opposite of your anxiety. Progress isn't a straight line. It's totally normal for these thoughts to pop back up and feel really upsetting even after you think you've kind of quote unquote kicked them. And that's normal. It gets less intense with time, but it, it always happens. And it's just, it's just part of being human. It's powerful to share your deepest fears with someone who doesn't take them so seriously. So we have this blah, blah, blah image here. Um, something we often do, especially with kids, is we have this great little recording. So I'll have them say to me, you know, I want to kill my dog. I want to kill my dog. I want to kill my dog. And we play it. <laughs> you know, kind of roll our eyes and go, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so you want someone who doesn't, who doesn't buy into this fear. Because that's the fear is really the only problem. And then finally, we've made this point many times now, but you know, don't go at it alone. Whether it's a friend or a therapist, find somebody who can be on this journey with you. Now, here's a great question that came in. So when I'm doing one of my exposures, what, am I, what do I do with, when I feel that high anxiety? What am I supposed to do in that, in that moment? Yeah. Just feel it? So I try to reassure myself? How do I cope? Staying in it is really the key point. So one of the main things that gets in the way of progress is when people in subtle or more overt ways try to distract themselves from that, that fear. And what you want to do is just see if there's nothing scary there. Um, so it's a matter of just exposing yourself and staying in it long enough, which is really hard. That's why help is, help is good. Um, but you will get through it. And you'll see this is boring. This, isn't, this, isn't an, this is a false alarm. So I don't want to try to reassure myself or calm myself down. I want to just feel the anxiety. You exactly. You want to feel it and you want to see there's nothing there to really be afraid of. Okay. And so when is it time to get help? Well, um, clinically we would say, you know, when there's some sort of meaningful impairment or distress and impairment means there's some kind of observable negative impact on your life, whether that's, you know, you don't get as much sleep because these images pop into your mind or you avoid certain meetings at work or even certain parts of your kitchen because you're worried about what you might do in those places, or just distress, you're suffering. Um, either way, this doesn't have to be some huge deal. For many people with harm OCD, all of this is very upsetting. There is a lot of impairment and distress, but even if it's on the sort of quote unquote lighter side, if it's you know just a bit, if it's worrisome, get treatment. You know, It's not such a huge deal. And it's sort of like if you have strep throat, you would go into a doctor, you'd get it diagnosed, and you'd you know, get your antibiotics. And in that same way, we always say, Figure out what's going on and work with it. Do your exposures. You know, you deserve to, to get through this. So some tips then for getting help. Uh, the big one is just get it. You know, it doesn't have to be the perfect process. So kind of the gold standard treatment would be cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT for harm OCD. So working with a therapist who specializes in this. And um, cognitive behavioral therapy is sort of the umbrella term for this empirically supported treatment that um, 
exposure and response prevention falls under. And some defining features are that it focuses more on the present than the past, not exclusively at all, but uh, the idea is whatever factors are maintaining your distress now might be different than what initially set it off. So maybe you became worried about stabbing your wife after you read a news article, but today you're not reading that article every single day. Something else is maintaining the fear, probably avoidance. Um, so CBT for harm OCD is excellent, but if you live somewhere where there isn't a CBT therapist or someone who specializes in that, um, that's okay. And working with any therapist who um, is trained and who feels like a good fit, and we'll go into that in a moment, uh, can be really helpful. You might bring in one of these resources, we'll show you in a second about harm OCD and they can kind of work through it with you. Or it's possible that, you know, like a workbook and a friend might do. Um, conversely, you might need more. You might need something more intensive, seeing somebody several times a week. Anywhere on the spectrum is fine, but we just really encourage people to jump in and find what you need. And we have some links down here to um, a number of different resources for finding not just therapists, but also more readings on OCD and harm OCD. And here are a few of my favorites, and I can say this because I'm not Dr. Kissin, mm -hmm. but um, I have here a book, Overcoming Unwanted Intrusive Thoughts, which is great. It gets at sort of why these thoughts come up, how you can work with them. Um, this Huffington Post, Post blog written by Dr. Kissin, which is really excellent. It's short, it's pithy. It helps summarize a lot of the information we've given you today. And it can be great for bringing in, for example, to a provider so that you can say, you know, I, I have thoughts about killing someone, but I, I think this might be what it is. Gives them a little context or giving it to, you know, a loved one so they can start to understand. Um, so, Dr. Kendall, maybe leave these two on the screen just for a moment while I ask you one of the questions that came in. Sure. And people maybe could copy down the name of the book and the name of the article, and they could probably find it if they Google Huff Post Harm Related OCD, Deborah Kisson. Uh -huh. That's a really great article. Um, and one of the questions that came in is a little bit different than we've talked about so far. It says, uh, I fixate on thinking about something terrible that I may have already done. Like if I'm driving my car and I hear a bump and I'm worried, did I just run over somebody? And is that harm OCD or is that something a little different? Yeah, so the fear thought, uh, it's it, one thing and nothing is completely like this bucket is definitely harm OCD. So the fear thought is, oh no, I wasn't careful enough, or oh no, I just ran over someone and harmed someone. And normally what goes along with that is, and then I'm gonna go to jail for hit and run, and then I'm gonna be locked in jail, and I'm gonna be alone and away from my loved ones for the rest of my life. So I've found that often the hit and run kind of goes down to that fear of being sent to jail for doing something. So uh, it's not, oh, I, just lost control and oh no i'm having the thought i want to lose control and run over these people it's a more of a oh no did i was that bump actually a person and was i not being careful enough and now i'm going to get in trouble similar like oh no did i leave the stove on but it's responsibility for harm which mm -hmm. th they could all come together in this response could i be responsible for harm kind of place so the same kinds of tools it might take a little bit more work to come up with what's my fear hierarchy going to be? I don't know if it would take more work. It, it's same kind of protocol, same okay. protocol of ERP for OCD. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, yeah, you do the same kind of thing in creating a hierarchy. Okay. We got a message from a therapist that suggested that we also mention ocfoundation.org. Great. Yeah, thank you for that. Source. So lots of really good information on providers that specialize in the treatment of OCD through. So for um, everybody out there, that would just be OC, just the OC part of the OCD, ocfoundation.org is another really good uh, way of finding a therapist. Great. And then just to close out here, this is a slide from ADAA. Um, it's very helpful. It um, highlights some different considerations if you're looking for a therapist. And I'm just going to hit on a few here now in our remaining moments. Um, you might ask somebody about, you know, if they accept your insurance, but just to say if you don't have insurance or a provider is out of network, many do work on a sliding scale. And another potentially great resource if you're anywhere near a university that has a training program, um, oftentimes, you know, young PhD students in clinical psychology, young master's students are 
being trained in really the cutting edge treatment by some of the leaders in the field. So you can always call up the school, see if they um, are doing any of this kind of treatment. And those are often very discounted since it's training, but it's, it's really can be excellent service. Um, you might ask, um, what is your treatment approach? Again, cognitive behavioral therapy can be really helpful, but it isn't essential if you can bring in these materials and you have someone who you think will work with you. Um, do you provide telemental health therapy? So we do some sessions you know, via Skype and other means if you know, you're not so close to somebody that you can get in, there are different options out there. Um, and then I'm gonna jump right to this very bottom one, how can I help in my recovery? Just to really highlight that the goal of therapy across all types, I always say as a therapist, is to make myself irrelevant. So you want you know, someone who is empowering you, who's giving you skills to figure out how to overcome this, um, who's you know, giving you quote unquote homework, things to do between sessions, who's helping you figure out how your mind works and helping you to move past your own anxiety. So I know we packed in lots and lots of information, but that's just because we're excited and we want to disseminate as much of this info as possible because everyone deserves to get past all the mental noise that might be kind of getting in their way. So we'll work with ADA. If there's any questions that we didn't get to, maybe we could post some blogs, maybe even at some point have a part two. So yeah, everybody that's watching now, uh, feel free to email questions. Uh, and the email address to send your questions is you web webinars at adaa.org. So that's webinars at adaa.org. And if you could just write in the subject line, harm OCD, uh, then uh, we'll have a chance to to get to your questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Kissen and Dr. Kendall. Thank and you, Neil. Always a pleasure. And bye for now, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye. bye.